morning and welcome to Fountain Street Church. My name is Reverend Greta Jo Seidel and I use she, her pronouns. And it is my honor to welcome you this morning to our summer speaker series with Lisa Locke and with music from Robin Connell. Wherever you are this morning, whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on this life's journey, you are welcome here. We come together virtually, and some of us <laughs> at the moment physically, in this beautiful building that we strive by our coming together to make a temple of love and peace, an inclusive community made by our collective strivings. And we welcome you into it this morning and in the days ahead. Thank you for being here. Latent grace, gentle pulsings of a planet, tender beatings of a heart, dying embers of the passions that have cooled, soul remains of youthful visions, reaching out and finding darkness. Where are those blazing stars of truth that once I fueled? Sing for me a song I cannot summon dance upon a heart that aches to learn, recite the verse which given birth could penetrate the haze, invoking muse and minstrel, guiding my return, carve away the layers of illusion, chisel out the tomb of unwept tears, sculpt a limber figure, freed to set a spirit soaring, and cast an iron vessel for my fears. My prayers ascend, my cries arise in silence. An unseen force attends the vigilant pleas, awaiting reclamation of the soul as self-creator, life diviner, willing witness to the irony. Now a reading from the lost notebooks of Lauren Isley. Just now in the midst of cold driving rain, in the turbulent winter boiling of clouds over his favorite perch on a wind-whipped sapling, I found him singing again. The sounds came up into my study and from the study into my heart. The melody hanging there like something from the timeless world of Plato's forms so that I was distracted from my tasks and began to think of springs long ago and a girl I remembered. I even put up the window in desperation and laid out some seeds, though I knew it was useless since that outer world was his and he eyed me, perhaps with justice, as being tinged with evil. Otherwise, why would I be seeking to purchase favors with good seed? But you have only two or three years more to learn the meaning of this, I said to him darkly. I am 45 and determined to know. With that song and what I have found in my books, maybe the secret could be learned by us together. There is not much time, you know, and less for you than me. It is important to know why one is singing. He did not fly up to the window. He sang on, those beautiful notes falling carelessly as raindrops across the house roofs falling into my heart, falling into the lanes of memory, bothering my pen in its slow way across the paper. I tore up the sheet, but I began again. I will start at the very beginning, I told him severely, though he was fainter now, and had, as I judged, perched farther away. I will begin at the beginning and find the way of it. To that song, I mean, and why I, who am not a bird, can be so troubled by it. 
I will begin at the very beginning. The pure voice did not mock me. It sang on as I wrote, but it does not help me. Out of the eternal garden of the forms, it does not know me. But as I listen, I know mankind should find its way thither. Music reaches down to us. That, at least, I know. that I know where the sycamores grow and daffodils have their fun where the cares of the day seem to slowly drift away in the glow of the evening sun It is so good to be back here in this sacred space, this sanctuary, which for over 60 years has played such a profound role in informing, inspiring, and in guiding my life's journey. I've been away seven and a half years ago after living virtually my whole life in Kent County. I moved to Delaware. Delaware, <laughs> my friends asked. I know, right? Followed by why, and my answer in two words, the ocean. My sister lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and had been vacationing in Rehoboth for the past 20 years. And eventually, she invited me there um, to spend 10 days with her uh, in a summer place that she purchased. And I remember saying to her, I could live here. And she said, well, you know, you could. You could live in my place at no cost while you look for a job and a place to live. And that is just what I did. I 
my kids were far away, scattered around the country, and this whole new adventure opened up to me. I put my house on the market. I gave notice to my colleagues at West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. I hugged my dear ones. I packed up my dog and I headed east. Driving over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, I remember calling out to Stella, my dog, we're home. And within six months, I purchased a wonderfully quirky 1970s modified mobile home, tucked in an old woodland neighborhood surrounded by 70-foot oak trees, and accepted the seasonal position in Rehoboth Beach City Hall at the front window, greeting visitors and screening phone calls. Quite an initiation. And then at the end of the season, having explored connections in the environmental community, I accepted the position of executive director of uh, Delaware Interfaith Power and Light, working with faith communities and community partners to address the issue of greatest concern and consequence to me, climate change. Providence, grace, it never ceases to delight and amaze me how mysteriously the mind works. Just below the surface of consciousness, the memories it taps and the perceptions that it translates, the connections it be makes between them all, and the undefined confidence that it can proffer. Last April, I received a lovely surprise email from Dick Wood inviting me to return to provide reflections for a summer service, and I excitedly accepted. But knowing it was months off, I set it on the back burner, especially since I was in the midst of preparing to retire from my position that I had de dedicated so much of my life to for the past seven years. And then I received an email from Carol Koistra that they would need a title within a few days, and I was a little panicked but just briefly, because the title spontaneously surfaced, and I knew that was it, though I had no idea where it would lead me. Latent Grace is a poem that I wrote over 20 years ago. In fact, it may have appeared in one of the collections of poems of Fountain Streeters. Memorized, of course, it has regularly returned to me over the years, but I had not revisited it where it sprang from, or how its meaning and significance might have evolved. And this opportunity has inspired me to do that. And I share those thoughts with you this morning with a little help from my friends. Gentle pulsings of a planet, tender beatings of a heart, dying embers of the passions that have cooled, Soul remains of youthful visions, reaching out and finding darkness. Where are those blazing stars of truth that once I fueled? My prayers ascend, my cries arise in silence. An unseen force attends the vigilant pleas, awaiting reclamation of the soul as self-creator, life diviner, willing witness to the irony. As a friend remarked sympathetically, it sounds so mournful. And certainly it reflects both a spiritual numbness and a state of angst, commonly defined as a period or a feeling of deep anxiety or dread, typically an unfocused one about the human condition or the state of the world in general. There is indeed much to feel profoundly anxious about in these crazy times. In existential philosophy, they associate angst with a dread caused by awareness of our future, that our future is not determined, but that it must be freely chosen by us. While I would not define it for myself in that way, due largely to my parents and growing up here at Fountain Street Church, I have never looked to a higher power for direction or meaning. I have always considered free will a given, an exciting, if anxiety-producing, adventure, and a sacred responsibility. While the poem surely expresses a lamentation with prayers ascending and silent cries, seeking the aid 
of a comforting and guiding force, it is an invocation to myself, to something divine and wise harboring deep within, which lays in yearning patience to be made manifest. Thus, in knowing that, the irony, a latent state of grace, in revisiting this, I have been captivated by the concept, the sources of grace, the ways in which we experience grace, how our perceptions are changed by grace, how our experience of grace flows outward into the world, and why it is so elusive. I think of the quality of graciousness, defined by words like courteous, kind, pleasant, charming, a generosity of spirit, it is that generosity of spirit that speaks so deeply to me. My parents were gracious, possibly the most gracious people I have ever known. In the words of H. Drummond, there are some men and women in whose company we are always at our best. While with them we cannot think mean thoughts nor speak ungenerous words, their mere presence is elevation, purification, sanctity. All the best stops in our nature are drawn out by their intercourse, and we find a music in our souls that was never there before. Here, ever on the common plane of life, talking our language, walking in our streets, here, breathing through common clay, is heaven. I found the Drummond quote decades ago in a little black notebook, tattered and faded, containing writings collected by my mother throughout her life on love, hope, compassion, courage, suffering, responsibility, the search for truth, and the beauty and mystery of the natural world. Taken together, it charts the evolution of a single spirit, a philosophy of gracious living. The unfolding of a personal journey of the heart and mind and spirit, it expresses ideals my mother struggled to live up to that ignited her passions, guided her actions, and infused her days with simple joy. It was a legacy to her children, this notebook depicted an inner struggle between being and doing, between retreating and engaging, between savoring and saving. My mother felt truly blessed, and she was deeply haunted. Blessed by a life of loving ties and generous circumstance, haunted by her own expectations of what was thus required of her, and she passed that on to us. My parents were gracious to others, each in their own distinctive ways. It was inherent in them, not something unconscious, but I think unselfconscious, interacting with others with a natural reciprocity, an openness, a loosening of barriers, and a generosity of spirit. And people responded, often with graciousness returned, and I would like to believe playing it forward. But I have to wonder, did they equally extend that graciousness to themselves? How did they experience grace? I know they struggled, they were haunted, they were human. But I saw in both of them a goodness, a shared sense of wonder, a simple purity of joy that has intimately inspired my own understandings. The definitions and experiences of grace obviously cover a widely varying spectrum, especially between the sacred and the secular. Well, I, here are three divergent samplings. First, words to a very familiar hymn by John Newton, a slave trader turned abolitionist. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. 
and from a favorite novel, Smilla's Sense of Snow by Peter Hoag. I feel the same way about solitude as some people feel about the blessings of the church. It's the light of grace for me. I never close my door, but behind me without the awareness that I'm carrying out an act of mercy toward myself. And from Wendell Berry, when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives will be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty in the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. And for a time I rest in the, in the grace of the world and am free. How differently I imagine the roots of these reflections and the sources of their blessings. Looking upward, confessions of guilt, professions of faith and gratitude and surrender, enlightened salvation. Looking inward, merciful blessings of solitude, space and forgiveness, self-reflection and replenishment, being comfortable in your own skin looking outward to timeless patterns, inherent beauty, ageless wisdom, each of us a cog in the wheel, a strand of the web connected to all. Divergent, but so many commonalities. And this was reinforced when I asked a few of those close to me to share their thoughts on grace. And here is a composite of their answers. The courage to be vulnerable, to surrender, setting aside ego mind, connecting through the heart, through faith. Apology and forgiveness, not only for the harms or hurts caused by me, but also those I afflict upon myself. The revelation that I was going to be fine at the most fragile time in my life, a light and a path by grace no fear. Open to change, entering the stream of life, finding balance. Room, space for life to unfold. Living by the strength of your convictions and the depth of your compassion, while never forgetting your place in the universe. We are so very small, and that is a beautiful thing. It is not something to be feared, but celebrated hearing the sound of stars, unconditional love, living by instinct as all other creatures who live continually in a state of grace. My own unfolding definition of grace is a state that prepares me both to give and to receive, providing a bridge, a window, an entryway in the absence of fear and the presence of the divine whatever form that takes. And the qualities it compels? Authenticity. In the words of E.E. E. Cummings, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you everybody else, means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. To be able to unselfconsciously greet and embrace the world. I love this quirky quote by Naomi Shahab Nye. I want to be famous in the way a pulley is famous or a buttonhole, not because it did anything spectacular, but because it never forgot what it could do. Compassion is captured in the familiar John Nesbeck refrain recited from this pulpit and performed by the choir. The quiet heart knows the pace of kindness. The quiet heart measures love in gentleness. The quiet heart sees beauty in reality. The quiet heart survives in understanding. 
the quiet heart waits in yearning patience to find the mind of God. Joy. I have found no more delightful expression of joy than this translation from the French by Rumor Godden. Let me carry a sprig of hope and joy. Give me such philosophic thoughts that I can rejoice everywhere I go in the lov lovable oddity of things. Give me great courage and gentleness. I need a little wild freedom, a little giddiness of heart, the strange taste of unknown flowers, and connectedness. This to me is the most elusive and possibly the most profound. Sensing, truly experiencing my place in creation and my connection to every animate and inanimate entity, for in the words of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, living intuitively in relation with the other beating hearts and sparking neurons in ebbs and flows and births and deaths and transformations on this miraculous planet, and yes, this unfathomable universe of which we are each a part. Every glimpse, every coursing of those shared atoms, that to me is grace. In those moments, I feel complete, at least temporarily. Grace is fickle, oh so fragile and fleeting. How is it we so quickly and easily fall out of grace once experienced, and so unexpectedly and wondrously find our way back? Because life hangs heavy, our senses are assaulted, we are pushed and pulled and distracted at every turn. Grace has a lot of competition. But as Mary Oliver writes, a lifetime isn't long enough for the beauty of this world and the responsibilities of your life. But it has to be. We owe it to ourselves. To listen for those sweet sounds of grace. To carry out acts of mercy toward ourselves. To seek out and feel one with the peace of wild things. So, no more the tomb of unwept tears no more the ache of wasted years, no more the song that goes unsung, no more the dance not yet begun, no more the fear that stifles flames, no more the endless waiting games. Well, I wish that were so, but that's just not the way that life works. We will be lost, we will be found, we will be lost again, but surely, we can beat a more familiar path to those places, those states that nourish and comfort and connect us and give us peace, sending that grace that flows through us back out into the world. Wishing love and space and grace unto you and the strange taste of unknown flowers. Amen. A line from our hymnal has been stuck in my head today and for this service. Drifting here with my ship's companions, all we kindred pilgrim souls, making our way by the light of the heavens. Can you sing the next verse or the next line? In our beautiful blue boat home. Well, we are making our way together here, my friends, my fellow pilgrims on this journey. And we steer the ship together. 
with your help, with your support of this institutions and our work together and in the world. So this is the part where I ask for your physical, financial support of our institution, of this place, of this community. I invite you to give generously. That maybe it might feel a little less like drifting and a little more like a collective journey towards wholeness. Thank you again for being with us this morning, from wherever you are, from a couch, from a table, from a phone, from a laptop, from Grand Rapids or beyond. Thank you for being here, for trusting us with your morning, for trusting us to be your community. Thank you again to Lisa and Robin for this wonderful service offered to us this morning. I'll leave you with words from Darcy Roke. There is too much hardship in the world not to find joy every day. There is too much injustice in the world to not right the balance every day. There is too much pain in the world to not heal every day. Each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth now and do that which is calling us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of divine presence every day. May this community carry you forward every day until we are together again. Blessed be.
Just